Father, thank you for this new series. I'm going to do the kickoff today, and then we'll have a couple weeks off because of the one services. But Father, thank you that we have access to your throne room by the Spirit. Thank you for the people you brought here for the message today, Lord. Thank you, Father, that we have a choice in our life to live for you, that we're no longer debtors to the old man, but that we are no longer slaves, but we are sons and daughters of God. And we thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so the series, you know, I was teasing, it's called But We See Jesus, and a number of you who've been to Wednesday night when, when I've mentioned it or when you've been there when I've preached over the pulpit or here on Sunday mornings, you've heard me say that there are a lot of statements in the Bible where the Bible will be going one direction in the scripture and it will interrupt or it will transition and God or St. Paul or Peter will say this, 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 but... And then there's a change in the direction, or it's giving a qualifier to the statement. And I said, you know, there's so many good examples of that in the Bible. Somebody should do a Bible study on that. (laughs) And I said that probably over the last six months, numbers of times. And God finally laid it on my heart. Why don't you do that? So there you go. If God lays it on your heart, ask him if maybe he's wanting you to be the one. So, but we see Jesus is my take on God having us live our Christianity in an intentional way. Now, there's a lot of Christian artists and ministers and in the black gospel music industry particularly that have come out of the closet gay. There are a lot of artists nowadays trying to combine hip-hop, gospel, jazz, and fusing it all together. And the reason I bring all that up is... um, We know that everybody's going in a more carnal direction, worldly direction. The church for years has imitated the world in a lot of ways, you know, and it should be the other way around, but unfortunately the reality is it's not. In a lot of ways, the church tends to follow the world. Mm -hmm. But we know this, and one, one artist, he was raised a preacher's son, and I won't say his name, he's not gay, um, He was trying to justify his uh, music choice of the music he was creating, which is actually very interesting, and it's a whole new thing. There's a whole slew of artists today that are combining unusual elements that were usually incongruous in music and mashing them all together to make a new sound. And one thing he said was, when they said, well, how do you justify being a preacher's son and a Christian, and then you have a lot of worldly lyrics that you include in your music, as well as Jesus, And this is what he said. And you know what? At first you can say, what a cop-out, and he's a loser. But I thought about what he said really, really weighed on me. And it pertains to this study was how carnal the church has become. And this is what he said. In the black church, he goes, people go, amen, hallelujah, hallelujah. And they'll be all into it. And he goes, and Saturday night, they're doing the same things that the world does. They're partying, they're hooking up, they're, oh, yeah. they're doing all kinds. Of, and then Sunday afternoon, same that thing. Not uh-huh. just black church. And I know, but he was talking from a black church perspective. And so he said, what I'm endeavoring to do, which is his excuse, is to bring it all together to make it real or authentic. So I get his point, but I don't think God's point is that to make it more real, we become an amalgamation of both the worldly and the spiritual. I think God's point is, yes, that is the reality in the church, and something or someone needs to change, and that's us. It's not about, God did not focus the ministry of Jesus Christ on walking around finding special groups to condemn. Jesus did not do that. He did not go and picket gay people. That's right. Jesus did not come and look for the alcoholics and the drug addicts. He did not. In fact, his most pointed discussions were delivered to the lawyers, teachers of the law, and to the religious, hypocritical leadership that was in place. And what we need to do as a church is embrace the fact that we are human beings and understand that we are flawed, weak, whatever you want to say. But let's not settle for that. And as Pastor Tom says with the whole identity teaching, let's remember who we are. Mm -hmm. Who we are. We forget. And becoming more like the world so that we can relate to them is not 
the answer. I think that's a very commercial answer to make money. I think the answer is that Christians can be real. They can be authentic by owning their errors and their mistakes yeah. in humility to inspire other people, but then show them that there is a way out, and that way out is Jesus. Yeah. So today we are going to talk about Romans chapter 8. And I am fired up about it. I literally have 20 pages of notes on that one chapter. And we are not going to... Oh, it's that? Oh, I know. It is a good chapter. So Romans chapter 8 is loaded up, and this is the title I've given it. Life in the Spirit versus Life in the Flesh. And this is not directed to worldly people. This is directed to worldly Christians. And you know what? I want a... You know what? I am going to ask for a showing of hands today. I am. I'm going to ask you straight up. How many times have you found yourself living no different than the world? Now, I'm not saying every single day, but have you had moments where if somebody of Jesus were to look in at your life on a given day, would he see, right? Would, would you? He'd see me and not him. Yes. Amen, Vicki. There's no shame. I'm not trying to shame anyone. I'm trying to show you that we're all alike, okay? And why I say that is because we are no different than the church was back then. They were infighting, they were jealous, they were competitive, yeah. they had sexual adultery, yeah. they had all kinds of stuff going on, incest in one instance, in the church. And we need to start, stop acting like it's a sacred cow, that oh, we don't talk about those things. We talk about them in this class. Because if we don't, if we just pretend it doesn't exist and everybody's a cookie cutter perfect Christian, that's not the truth. I don't know one person. I don't know one person except the Lord Jesus Christ who does it right, did it right, every single time, every single way. And everybody, just so you know, I have both my hands up too, that yes, some days I'd be ashamed if Jesus saw me in that instance, which he did. Oh, yeah, if he was standing there, right there, there yeah. if my husband, the pastor, was standing right there, if you were standing right there, I would be ashamed. Like, wow, was I showing Christ? Or like Vicki said, was I showing me? Mm -hmm. And did the world see Christ in that behavior or in that attitude? No. They didn't see anything of Jesus. They saw too much of me. So Romans chapter 8, we're going to talk about Life in the Spirit. So, um, Anna, could you read for us verses 1 through... Well, let's see, Anna. I want to make you read a big chunk here for me. Okay, it, verses 1 through 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. All right, we are going to stop there because in verse 9 it says, however, or but. But we are going to stop there. First of all. How many of us have sung that song, There is therefore now no condemnation in the Lord, right? All right, you know what? There is no condemnation. What does it say? Now. Now. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. But there's a qualifier. There is no condemnation for who? Those who are in Christ. That's right. Those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, why I bring that up is it says now. In the past, you and I were condemned. According to the law, the law of sin and death, you and I were judged and we were found <laughs> guilty. And when we lived in our sinner's ways before we knew Christ, we were condemned. We were condemned to die. We were condemned by the judgment that the law had. But it says, therefore, now. 
There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ. Who what? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. You know what? If you're walking after the flesh, sorry, my OCD is kicking in, huh? Because um, I keep tripping over that thing. Is if I'm walking after the flesh, there is condemnation. Do you know the Bible says that if we continue in sin, there is a certain looking forward to judgment mm -hmm. if we continue in sin. Mm -hmm. When people say, oh, I don't need to worry about it. Yeah, you do. If you're yeah, living a life of sin or secret sin or right. habitual sin, you do need to feel some conviction. And the devil will make sure you feel condemnation. Mm -hmm. Now, the condemnation, people like to say, that comes from the devil and conviction is from the Holy Spirit. And they are absolutely right. But you place yourself in a situation where you are going to feel condemned and then if other people know, you go, well, I don't feel any condemnation. Well, you know what? Sometimes it says godly sorrow works repentance. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you are walking in a wrong direction and God is allowing you to make that decision to hopefully that his child will learn that when we go out to be with the pigs, we end out in the trough with them, just like the prodigal son, yeah, yes? Right. He was still a son, but it says that he was even hungering for what was in the pig trough at one point because he had used up all the inheritance he took from the Father. That is a picture of Christianity today. We have people who think they can walk both sides of the fence, live like the world, live like Jesus, and they use up their inheritance. Do you know what I'm saying? If you're walking in the world, you're running on like your phone battery, you know, I got my phone in here. If it's not plugged in, and I'm walking around, little little caramel phone out in the world, eventually the juice is going to run low. You're going to use up that inheritance, and you're going to find yourself eventually amidst the pigs and the slop and getting dirty yeah. and being unclean and in a place where you were never designed to be. Because why? Just like this phone, it has to be plugged in. You and I were designed to be one with him. He didn't want you or me to be separate. That's why he That's sent Jesus. God never banished Adam and Eve from the garden when they sinned first. It's their sin that separated Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. See, I want people to understand we have a good, good father. That's he awesome. loves us so much. But if you choose to live life according to the flesh, you are going to be walking in condemnation. Because you are outside of the umbrella of God's protection. Amen. And he has to allow you. Vicki's a parent. Angela, you're a parent. Stephanie, mom and dad, Noel, your parents. Nancy, you're a parent. My mom's a parent. You all know. You, I have no doubt for the people I just mentioned in this room, you all love your children. I know that. I know all of you well enough to know how much you love your children. Exactly. Have you, and I'm even including my mother in this, and even Stephanie, because I know her kids are saying, how many times have the moms and dads agreed with every single thing their kid did? Or were there examples where your child did something really dumb, really damaging, self-injuring, and the mom and dad couldn't do a thing about it? Right? They had to kind of let them walk it out, didn't they? Mm -hmm. You couldn't lock them up. You couldn't spank them once they're a certain age. You had to let them choose. Right. I want to say it's today, there is no condemnation for you if you are in Christ Jesus. But you have a choice. That's the thing. I was trying to convey that to Bob that one time. Is We are free. But the Bible says we can be entangled again with the yoke of bondage oh, and relations. Yeah. So we are free. There is therefore now no condemnation, but the verse goes on to say, for those who are in Christ Jesus, and some verses say, or some translations say, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Mm -hmm. If you walk after the flesh, there's no guarantee you won't feel some condemnation. And I believe that some of that, moms and dads, just like the prodigal son father, he let the son go run off, do some dumb stuff, some sinful stuff, some immoral stuff, hoping that his son would come back. But he didn't have that guarantee, did he? Right. No, no. And no, no, thank no. God, God is God, the son did come back, and the father had open arms. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying today is, 
life in the spirit versus life in the flesh, the Bible tells us clearly that the way of the transgressor is hard. And a lot of Christian ministers like to say that means for the sinner, the way of the sinner is hard. That is not what it says. I love the more that I study the Bible, he just explodes it in me. He says the way of the transgressor is hard. Chris, what does transgress mean? It means merely to break the law. Right. Transgress, gress, like progress, has to do with your walk. Cross over the line. That's right. So progress means you're walking forward. Progress. You put those two together and it makes the word progress means you're walking forward. Transgress means you're changing, you're turning, you're deviating from the path. Yeah, trans. Got that? Did you get that? The way of the transgressor is hard. That means even if you're a Christian. Mm -hmm. My life's so hard, it sucks. Are you walking in the way? Or have you deviated off the path and taken a little bunny trail? You know, like in Hawaii, they have all these signs that say, please stay on the path. It, Chris, you and I were talking about this too, about the laws for the lawbreaker in prior conversations. Here's what happens. You put a sign up or a little fence, and let's say a little fence that's low enough that people can hop over, and you say, please stay on the path. Mm -hmm. What do people do? They go off the path. <laughs> Most of the people stay on the path, but there's always that rogue person or people, people that jump over and do it anyway. The law is for the... Law breaker. Law breaker. That's right, Vicki. You're not under the law because the if law. you're following Jesus, you're not under it. But you are under the law. If you're going to transgress, you're going to be judged by the law. If you're with Jesus, grace and truth are yours. But if you transgress, so here's what happens in Hawaii. They have these treacherous paths. I'm not kidding. It was rigorous for Tom and I. I'm not kidding. It went up, up, up for two miles. Uh -huh. On rocks, switchbacks, up, up, slippery, uh, cliffs, ravines, drop-offs. And there a couple places along the path, there would be a little guardrail, only a couple places. And there would be a sign, please stay on path. Well, because people are stupid and they think it's cute to violate, they even put another sign up that says next to it, that um, not responsible for death or drowning, blah, blah, blah. You have to put a little fear in people to realize mm -hmm. it's not just we're being legalistic here. Even we're sure not just protecting the plant life here. We're yeah. saying that if you do this, there is a consequence. You know, God said, choose you this day whom you will serve. Well, it be God or man, right? Jo Joshua said, this day, my house and I, as for me, my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Well, when God says, choose life or death, blessing or cursing, but I'm telling you, choose life. You know, Jews, they wear a, a little necklace symbol, and it looks kind of like a hand and all that. And it's, it's actually a Jewish symbol, and it means Lahaim. It means life. Choose life. Choose life. So there's no condemnation if we are in Christ Jesus. But if we transgress the law, we're no different than the sinner in this sense. As long as we're transgressing, life is hard. Now... Life doesn't become easy because you're a Christian, but here's what life does afford you when you're a Christian. When you, like Angela and like Vicki were saying, when you stay on the path with Jesus, it doesn't guarantee you that there's never an obstacle or a struggle. No. It guarantees that you got someone with you. Yes, amen. Like they tell you never dive alone. You've got to have a dive buddy for safety purposes. You're never diving alone with Jesus. You on that path of transgression, you're on your own. Catch it. You removed yourself, in a sense. And it's not that God goes away. He's waiting with open arms. But he's given you and I free will to walk in con condemnation or to not walk in condemnation. And the walk, the direction, the choice is yours. Yeah. God Amen. doesn't want automatons That's or right. robots. That's right. He wants human beings. So he gives you a choice. Mm -hmm. And he's hoping you'll choose right. And there's reward for choosing right. Mm -hmm. Now verse 2 says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Mm -hmm. Notice, when we are in Christ Jesus, the law doesn't apply to us. You know why? Because when you're with Jesus, you're going to do the right thing because you're in right relationship. Here's the difference. The law had the might, right? Mm -hmm. Only towards certain things. It still could not contain or control the flesh. Mm -hmm. It could only control the outward action. <clears throat> All right. Uh, 
People would like to say, oh, well, you've got to keep the law. No, Jesus said I fulfilled the law. I'm not doing away with it. I'm the fulfillment of it. And he said, upon the whole law, all the commandments, all the prophets, they hang on two laws. Jesus took ten and all the other Jewish laws, that there's hundreds of them, and he boiled it down to two. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And the second great command is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two things hang all the law and commandments. You want to know if you're walking in condemnation? Simple question. Am I walking right? These are the two questions. Is my life right now? What I'm doing right now? Let's just boil it down to right now. What I'm doing right now, is it honoring God? Is it showing my love for God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my might? Second question, in what I'm doing, in what I'm showing, in what I'm reflecting, am I loving my neighbor as myself? If you can answer those questions, yes, then you know you're walking in Christ. <laughs> if you say no to either one of those, mm -hmm. that is a caution light, a yellow flashing yeah. light that says, pause, mm -hmm. wake up. And I love that the Bible tells us that there's two choices. You are not under the Greek or Roman God system where the gods manipulate us like puppets, and we're just held by the fates and whatever they determine at their caprice or their whim. You have two choices. There's the spirit, the law of the spirit, mm -hmm which it says we have in Jesus Christ, and there is the law of the flesh. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, what I think right. is so interesting right, is right. the law could not have strength because of the flesh. The Bible just told us that. Because why? Because the flesh is the weak link. Yeah. The law can't control this unruly thing because mm -hmm. Paul the Apostle even said he can't control it all the time. Yeah. So what do we do in the Christian church when we're struggling? A lot of us do the dumb thing. I'll tell you what we do. Besides making the wrong choice, we don't like what we're seeing, so we go look at it in somebody else. <laughs> because it's easier for me to see the temper that's, that reminds me of me, and I don't want to choose anybody in here, in John Doe over here. And we begin to look at them, and we criticize them, and we judge them. And, yeah. You know what? The Bible is addressing everything first and foremost to you and to me. He's not saying, this is for you to tell your spouse. I'm giving you this to tell your kids or to tell your neighbor or to tell your boss. I'm telling you, church, this for you. Mm -hmm. So Amen. there's a choice. And it says in verse 3, well, first, verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death because the law was weak through the flesh. So God had remedy. It says sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and condemned sin in the flesh. The law could only guide and teach us what sin was, but it couldn't cure us. Jesus, with the law of the Spirit, he came. I want you to know, it didn't just say Jesus came as sinful flesh. We already know Jesus came as a man. The Bible says he came as fully man, fully yeah. God. Yeah. But it says in the likeness of sinful flesh. We know Jesus was the perfect Lamb of God without sin. But he came in the likeness, meaning having a body that could hunger, that could right. be bruised, mm -hmm. that could be broken, that could struggle, that could be under stress. All those things, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Why? The Bible tells us the why. It says he came in that likeness so that what? In the likeness of sinful flesh and, verse 3, as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 4, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Do you get that? The law has been fulfilled if you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord because he's paid the penalty for oh, sin. Right. He came and fulfilled what you and I couldn't do in the flesh. Right. Jesus did it. Jesus accomplished it. Chris, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Go ahead. I think I just thought of something. And that was, uh, so the law, the worst it can do is condemn you. Mm-hmm. And yes. that's pretty terrible, but... Mm -hmm. If you have Christ, you've already been condemned and acquitted. So it yes. just disarms the law, basically. Yes, well, like it said, 
Chris, like it said, it says we have been set free. It says we've been set free. Mm -hmm. That's in verse 2. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Because, yes, that is the point I was going to make, is we were all condemned. Remember, I started out saying we were condemned. Mm -hmm. But Jesus was the condemned man. Though he was perfect, he took it all on so that you and I could be set free from right. that law. Right. But I want you to understand, and we're going to see this, is the Bible says you still owe a debt. But the debt you owe is not long, no longer to sin and life in the flesh, but to Jesus. We owe it to our Jesus to live for That's him. Right. So yeah. we do have a responsibility. It's not like, oh, okay, I've been set free. I'm free I indeed in Christ, so I do what I want. No, no Paul says, no, no, guard against that spirit uh -huh. of licentiousness that says, I have a free license to do what I want. He says, God forbid. Grace wasn't given for that reason. It was given so that you have the ability that even if you do fall, you remember you have an advocate with the Father, Amen. Jesus Christ right. the righteous, yeah. that though we fall seven times, the righteous man rises up again. And the reason he can rise is because Jesus rose from death, sin, hell, and the grave. He conquered it. He rose again. That same spirit lives in you and I, and it causes us to have overcoming victory, even our faith, that if we have faith, not in our faith, but faith in him mm -hmm. and his finished work, we too will rise again. That's right. Because we've been buried with him at baptism, crucified with him. Now verse 4 says, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. I want to say that again. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. The requirement has been satisfied in Jesus. Yes. But it's not for everyone. I want you to see the qualifier again. I think Christian people, for so long, we keep thinking it's about the sinner. It's about the sinning Christian. Mm -hmm. This verse says, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Did you get that? That the law, the satisfaction of the requirements of the law have been met in the finished work of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it only pertains to those who walk after the spirit, not according to the flesh. Because if you walk according to the flesh, you're under condemnation still. But if you walk in the law and liberty of Jesus Christ, and you accept his law of love and liberty, you've been set free. But you haven't been set free like some animal they turn loose that runs wild no, in the no, wilderness. No, 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 no. You've been set free to serve. Yes. You've been set free, delivered into another kingdom under another king's domain. You've been set free from the slavery of sin right. and death because the devil will always drive you. You know what a cattle drive is? Oh, yeah. Hey, a cattle drive, what do they do? They have horses, they have dogs or other animals that are helping herd these animals. They drive them. Yeah. The devil and sin and life in the flesh and the carnal man, your carnal nature, my carnal nature, drives you to do some bad things. The Holy Spirit does not drive. He leads. And again, the implication is you have a choice to follow. When you default to your carnal nature... You're doing what the devil wants in effect because you're being driven, directed by those lusts. Mm -hmm. But it takes effort. See, because you don't have to choose to do wrong, do you? Many times that's the first thing that happens when you're in a stressful situation or a negative situation or a painful situation. It's easy to do the wrong thing. But the Bible says that we have a choice to walk in the way of the Spirit. In the way of the spirit. Yes, Vicki. I just want to comment on this. Um, the first instinct is to do what your flesh would do. Yeah. Be. I was in a car accident, a little fender bender, a, long, a while ago, mm -hmm. and on the front of my license plate, okay. it says, I serve a risen God. And this lady hit me, and we both got out of our vehicles and we both started screaming at each other, and she had a fish next to her like, oh, and we both, went, oh, Lord. we both went oh what are we doing good and it was really weird to have us both go I am so sorry you know 
um, forgive me, and it was just very. Wait, that tough. we went a long time ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. It was about oh, I say a year and a half ago. Oh, okay. but anyway, we both just went and stopped with there was no information <laughs> that needed to be exchanged, and it was like it was like God was right there. Yeah, saying, "What do you think yep. you're doing?" Thank God, you know, Vicky. That's because our, but our first instinct, we yelled right. at each other. We were like, "What do you think you're doing? And why right. would you?" And it was like, "Did you have to think or premeditate that reaction?" No. Uh, you were mad. No, no, that was it. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. like yeah. that, right? And that, but, but to, but to stop it, we had to think. That's yes. what I'm saying. Oh. That's so the Bible says there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Oh. Oh. Some translations leave it off, and I realize scholars argue about it, but the. The thought, the concept is still there, whether it's included or not, for those who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. And I want to tell you that the Holy Spirit, He leads and guides you mm -hmm. in all truth. Jesus is the good shepherd who will lead you on the paths That's of right. righteousness. The devil will drive you oh, yeah. into the wilderness. The devil oh, yeah. and sin, and I want to extend this a little bit, the carnal man yes. that we okay. kind of think is a nice guy mm -hmm. that's our roommate. No. He is not your friend. No, right. He is the deadbeat boyfriend on the couch that you need to get rid of. <laughs> you keep cohabitating with this guy because you think he's you. You have not been joined to your carnal nature. In fact, if you're a Christian, and I know everyone in this room is, you were supposed to divorce. Put away the old man, put on the new man in full righteousness. You're not married to sin. You've been set free. Stop acting like you owe a debt to your sinful nature. I don't care if you're Irish and you have a temper, Korean and you have a temper, Scottish and you're cheap, and all the stupid things that go with that. It does not matter. Because you have a new bloodline. That's right, amen. But there's a walk involved. It says there's no condemnation. There is no law of sin and death if you walk following the Spirit. It doesn't say if God forces you into the highway of holiness. He says if you will walk after the Spirit. Notice it's walking after the Spirit. It means he's leading your following, not your leading and asking the Spirit to bless it. He's leading in your following. All right, so verse 5 says, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for the mind set on the flesh is death. Mm -hmm. It didn't say the mind on the flesh leads to death. It says it's death. And it goes on, and Anna read it for us, and we'll get there. It also says it isn't like an enemy. It is the enemy of God. What is life in the flesh. What is my thinking that's stinking thinking, carnal nature thinking? It says it's an enemy with God. And you know why it's an enemy with God? You think God's mad at you when you think incorrectly negative, nasty thoughts about people or about things or about your life? You know why God gets upset? He's not mad at you for having that thought. He remembers your sinful flesh nature that rises mm -hmm. up. You know what he's mad at? He's mad that once again, sin is getting between you and him. Yeah. It bothers him. It upsets him. It stresses God in the sense of he doesn't want anything between you and him. But he has to allow us who were created in his image to have a choice. It says, those who are according to the flesh. How do you judge if someone's in the flesh? According to this verse, it says that they set their minds on the things of the flesh. What did Jesus say? Take no thought for the morrow. For tomorrow has enough evil in it. Today has enough evil to deal with. But it also says, don't think about what you'll eat or drink. Don't be like the Gentiles who operate in the futility of their mind. Do you know that staying in your head space is futile? Yeah. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care what your IQ is. I don't care what job you hold, what school you graduated from. If you get stuck in your head, the Bible says, don't be like the Gentiles who are what? In the futility of their mind trying to do their life. The Bible says that we have a choice, and it says you can judge if a person is in the spirit, according to verse 5, for the mind set on the flesh is death. The mind, but... The mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we're going to join verses 5 and 6 back together again. For those who are according to the flesh, what? 
They set their minds on the things of the flesh. Get that? You will know how much you're operating in the flesh by where your thought life is. You will know how much you are in the spirit by where your spirit is, where your thought life is. Is your thought life constantly worrying about every single thing around you every minute of the day? Probably not. Most of us probably not every single day. Is your mind 100% on the Bible? Yeah. And Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. And being a good person? And being challenged? I don't, not I am. Probably not. Oh. We're a mixture, aren't we? Yeah. We're a combination, <laughs> aren't we? But the Bible, this is why I said this whole series, and Chelsea put it in the bulletin, it's about intentionally living for Christ. We go on fast forward, and then we go on autopilot. We just get in the car, we go to work, or we go to school, or we get up, and we do our housework. We're not intentional, and so then we default to what comes natural. Like Vicky said, the car accident. First thing out your mouth is, la, 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 whatever that is. Yeah. Sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes it's cuss words. Yeah. <laughs> okay, if I'm not honest enough with you, there's not going to be an impact. I have to be honest with you. And you all look like angels, but I'm going to tell you what. <laughs> you may not cuss like a sailor. You may not cuss like a sailor, but you might cuss in your head, and you know what I'm talking about. Oh, wow. But when, and you notice a difference, I'm so proud of Vicki. What she and that woman did, I'm not even going to condemn that, because that's called human nature. If they had continued in that vein, two Christian women in an accident yelling at each other, that's natural. Yes, it is. The difference is, Vicki and this woman, because they've been joined to the Lord, are supernatural. Well, now, there's another problem. <laughs> another problem. These women identify themselves as Christians on their cars. Huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Now, everybody's going to be looking at that one. Is that how Jesus drives? <laughs> Jesus be giving sign language out the window? Jesus yelling at people? Right? But they caught themselves. And that is the key cut the, cut the for today that Vicki has just nailed perfectly with the example. Is when our mind is on the spirit, when we put more into it, spiritually speaking, yes. into this thing, the matter between the ears, mm -hmm. you're going to have a greater likelihood of responding after the spirit and following him. But if you don't, you'll be driven by the dictates of the flesh in your carnal mind. And if your mind has been filled up on Comey True. versus Trump, oh. uh, if your mind has been filled up with the economy about Kim Jong-il getting ready to bomb Japan and going on again, if your mind has been filled with the stupid people at work and the dumb people at church and everything my husband did that upset me yesterday, today, and every day, or my wife, or my kid, or my parents, or my brother-in-law, you know what? You're going to do just like Vicki did, and you're not going to change it, though. She and this woman had a realization. I'm going to say they had an aha moment, a come-to-Jesus moment. They said, what are we doing? Oh, and how many people get in a car accident and hug before they leave? Right. And we did. Okay. Right. All right. So, but it was, and you know what? We want to get more to that place. But we screw up, and we catch it. I don't want to be a liar and tell you that you're all going to be angels out there, and you're going to hit your, your thumb with a hammer, and you're all going to go, praise Jesus, bless God. That is not reality. You're probably going to say something else. Or if you're like me, when I stifle to something else, when I've injured myself, I throw myself on the ground, and I just hold it. And then, uh, and then I'm okay. When you're following the Lord, here's another right example. I was in the car with my carpool partner two years ago. We're on I-5. She's driving her brand new Camry. Brand new. I'm a passenger this time. This traffic is stop and go, and you know, people are all on their cell phones. The guy behind us doesn't stop. He's in a big truck. Not a semi, but a big commercial grade kind of Dodge Ram, the, the big horn edition or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay, if you're gonna have a big horn edition, it makes okay, my carnal mind says, what are we compensating for? Okay. <laughs> Alright. Because I got big horn, the ram, you know, okay. And so you get out of the car and you're probably this tall and like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this man slams into the back of us. I'm a Christian. She's a very moral woman, not a Christian. She has a brand new car. 
I was so proud. I had been, now I'm telling you a good time, and I'm not saying that's the only reaction that comes out of me. Neither one of us cussed. Neither one of us screamed. Neither one of us got mad. Neither one of us, we looked at each other, and the first words out of her in my mouth were, are you okay? Mm -hmm. Then I said, thank you, Jesus, that we're okay, and she let me do that. Mm -hmm. And then she said, okay, we'll get out of the car now, and we talked to the guy. And she could have yelled at that guy. It was all his fault. Mm -hmm. And he was a Texas boy, mm -hmm. which explains the rain. <laughs> he gets out of the truck, and he knows it's his fault, and we think he was on his phone. He didn't admit that. Oh, my wife's going to kill me. She probably is. <laughs> and um, he's like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Are you guys okay? He was really nice, and we found out he had an autistic son. We ministered love to him. The worldly woman and the Christian woman, right? together, were kind, loving, exchanged information, got the insurance, her car got repaired, not. We get back in the car, she says, can you drive us the rest of the way home? I'm too shook up. I said, of course I will. She goes, can you go all the back ways because I'm afraid of the freeway? I said, of course we will. And I said, may I say a prayer over you right now? And she's like, yes, yeah. so I'm driving her car. And I drive and I pray. And I was like, Lord, the impact should have put me in the hospital and her too. We waited three days, five days, seven days. All we had was a headache that night. We were okay. The guy was okay. Praise God. And then the car eventually was okay. All right. There's been other times I wake up on the wrong side of the bed like you all do, and instead of walking after the spirit, I allow the flesh to drive me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Now? Will you see these scriptures differently now? That to walk after the Spirit means you have to intentionally put on Jesus Christ to follow. Because if you do not fill yourself up with Jesus, if you don't make a choice to do it, you can be like Vicki and go through the bad thing, but if you make a choice that I want to do the right thing, you will catch yourself in midstream doing the wrong thing, saying, wait a minute, that was awesome to make a recovery. You know that God counts it just the same as what I did, counts the same what she did? Because it doesn't matter, no. it's the end result. Amen. That's what God's after. He counted it the same because she saw what she was doing, caught herself, the woman caught herself. They looked at each other and said, what are we doing? And they did it right. That when you walk after the Spirit, you are intentionally making a choice to follow God. If you do not, your carnal nature is going to dictate how you behave that day. Yeah. Yeah. And there is no vacuum in the Holy Spirit. There is no vacuum. All right, so it says, For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Did you get it? It says the mind. The mind set or focused on the spirit. The mind set focused on the flesh. What is the difference? Well, if my flesh is what I allow to drive me, it will lead to death. No, that's not what the Bible says here. It says in verse 6, for the mind set on the flesh is death. Wow. It's death. What translation are you using? This is New American Standard. Sorry, Stephanie. Yes, this is New American Standard. Now, which is a good point, I want to read it to you also in... Um, in the Amplified Version. Now the mind of the flesh, listen to this, now the mind of the flesh, which is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit, I'm going to say it again. Now the mind of the flesh, which is sense, your senses, your five physical senses, and reason, your noggin here, without the Holy Spirit is death. Death that comes that comprises all the miseries arising from sin, both here and hereafter. But the mind of the Holy Spirit is life and soul peace, both now and forever. So the mind of the flesh, it says, the mind of the flesh is this. It's your going by your five physical senses, what I can see, hear, feel, taste, right? That and your reasoning, your own thinking, apart from the Holy Spirit, that's the mind of the flesh. That's right. Every time you try to figure it out with your own head and you didn't invite Holy Ghost, 
to be a part of that solution. I know he lives in you, but he's waiting for an invitation. Do you know he lives in you? Jesus lives in you, but you can put him in a back room in the broom closet and never access. The Holy Spirit is fully willing to talk to you. That's right. The Holy Spirit of God wants to talk to you. But you have a choice. Do you want to set your mind? Now, some of you ladies are old enough to know what I'm talking about that some of you fellows may not know about this, but maybe Mike does because of where he works. But do you know what it means when a woman has her hair set? Especially older women when they go for a set. I don't know what it is, but they do get it done. Yes. So one of those things, the, the, the helmet thingy? They, they can, yes. I don't know what it is. Yes. They just, Nancy, do you know what a set is? is? Would you, you tell the boys? You raise your hair and all that. You, go, huh? you put the curlers in, you go into that humongous the helmet. See? So basically getting a set is where the women will have the curlers put in their hair. Mm -hmm. no, not a curling iron, curlers. Mm -hmm. And then they sit under the hood. Oh, yeah. And then they <laughs> spray it down with something. And so for that older ladies then they don't have to wash their hair or do anything for a few days because it's set. My uh, <laughs> uh, I've paid bills for the beautician all these years. That's right? what it is. But I didn't know what it was. I said, get her a wash and set. I know a that's wash what and set. It's a wash and set. I said, yes. give it to them. They get a free one here. Let's do it. But I don't know what it was. Until there you know. And then they don't have to get it done for I don't know what it is, but they wanted it, so I bought it. <laughs> and so that they wouldn't have to style their hair for several days or it was set with hairspray. And the oh, okay. All right. <laughs> to set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. That's Bible. Mm -hmm. To set. It means you have to make a choice and it takes a little yes. energy. It takes a little work. Preemptive. you got to intentionally make the appointment and pay the bill. And pay the bill means doing the work, the time, the mm -hmm. devotion. To set your mind on the spirit. It means to focus on the spirit. Now sadly, it's easy to set your mind on the flesh. Oh, it's easy. In fact, we get stuck there. It's like using Aquanet on your mind. You can just set and be just carnal. And even a wind tunnel isn't going to move that thinking. You're going to be stubborn mule. Right? With Aquanet. You know what I'm talking about. You all know what I'm talking about. Aquanet on your brain to set it in carnal nature. That's what the carnal nature is like. It's like having that set. Vicki, we're talking about setting your mind. And I was talking about what is a set. Got it. Sorry. Okay. When you set your mind on the spirit, it takes intention, work, yeah. time. A decision. But oh, a decision. Yeah. And to, yeah. no, to set your mind on the flesh, I said, that doesn't take as much work as much as it's like putting hairspray or aquanet on your carnal thicket. You set it all, right? You set it right in place. You're a stubborn little mule. You're set. Have you ever heard the term? I'm set in my ways, or she's set in her ways. Set means stubborn. It means it's fixed on that. Well, your carnal mind likes to do that naturally. But the Bible tells us, Paul is saying, it says that we are to set our mind on Christ. Set our affection on things above. Set our mind on the things of the Spirit. It says that because your thought life will dictate your walk. Absolutely. Your thought life will dictate your walk. If you're a fearful person, your life will manifest fear. But it starts here. It starts mm -hmm. here. I'm not I saying agree. you didn't have no, something I happen agree. in your life that caused sure. it to lodge yeah. there. But what I'm saying is still set. how this brain operates mm -hmm. is going to determine how you walk your life. Because that's where your belief system mm -hmm. is. Sure. All right. So we want to uh, set our mind on the spirit because it says there's life. And I like this. When you walk according to the mind of the flesh, the Bible says the carnal mind is death. I want you to stop thinking of your carnal mind as your best friend and your old roommate that you went to high school with. It's not. That thing, that carnal thinking, is death. You know, like, would we all agree in here, cigarettes lead to death ultimately, yes? I know, there's the story of the 90-year-old that still smokes, but you know what I mean. Sure. You would say tobacco is death. You would say alcoholism is death to the liver. Carnal thinking is death to the soul. So all of this is being talked to to the Christian. Mm -hmm. So it changes the, this gives a whole new concept too. And that's one thing I love about this chapter or uh, Romans 8 mm -hmm. is 
It puts a whole new spin on once saved, always saved. Well, now maybe because we can go wait a minute, because death is death. Death, death is, is death. walking away from God. Death. Sin, when it's fully conceived, is death. Yes. But the carnal mind, we all agree, sin when it's fully conceived leads to death. We agree. But it says the carnal nature is death. Yes, mm -hmm. Christopher. Uh, and then there's the course, the you know, first, second, third John, and John is also, of course, writing to Christians and yes. talking about mm -hmm. sins that lead unto death. Yes. Yep. Yep. There's death, because all sin ultimately does lead to death, if it's not addressed. Yes, amen. That's See, right. can we agree that if you were bleeding out of one of your limbs, you got cut really bad, if you did nothing about it, you could eventually die. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Or you could go to the doctor or to the care yeah. clinic yeah, and get stitches yeah. or medicine or whatever was needs mm -hmm. surgery. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sin is a killer, no matter what. That's right. But what we have forgotten about is carnal thinking is sin. Mm -hmm. It's death. Mm -hmm. If sin is death and carnal thinking is death, then carnal thinking is sin. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. I know. We like to treat it like it's our friend. Well, I didn't mean it that way. I know. I'm the same way. We're all the same, okay? I'm not trying to condemn you and make you feel bad. What I'm saying is we have to get the Bible perspective. It's our enemy because it's God's enemy. And if we keep trying to coddle that, thinking, oh, little fear, it's okay. It's understandable because you had a rough childhood and you got abandoned by somebody and this person beat you. No, you've got to start saying, that happened to me. It hurt like hell. I'm working through it. It's pain. I don't have the victory yet, but I will. But you are my enemy. I'm not going to treat it like you and I are in therapy together and we're going to get fixed. No, I'm going to say, I'm going to get the help I need, whatever it is. You are my enemy. Yes. Because as long as we think it's working with us, it's going to be working against you. That's right. Like Tom said, the carnal man cannot please God. You're right. The carnal man doesn't understand God, neither indeed can it. Can it? It says it can. So if we continue to follow what our natural thinking is, the ultimate end thereof is death. Uh, the Bible says that um, condemnation was directed at sin in the flesh. Now I want you to know that Adam originally was created in God's likeness to what? To rule and reign on the earth. Right? And Jesus, we read earlier, was created in the likeness of sinful flesh to die. Did you get that? Adam was created in likeness of God right. for life, to yes. rule and reign. Yes. Mm -hmm. Jesus was created, for the scripture tells us, a body thou hast prepared for me to do thy will, O God. He's mm -hmm. talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. His body he was created in the likeness of sinful flesh to die so we could live. Originally, right. we were created to live, right. but we forfeited it in the garden at the fall. Jesus came back to restore that. In his dying, he condemned sin, the law that was at work in us, to bring us into the law of liberty of Christ. It says the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. So Jesus has delivered us from sinful flesh. He became the condemned. The choice in the garden resulted in spiritual death. The choice Jesus made in the garden of Gethsemane resulted in restoration of life. He became the firstborn of the resurrected from the dead. He became the firstborn from the dead, the Bible says, that he might bring many sons and daughters alive to God. God said, I knew they would blow it, so I had Jesus come to restore it. Jesus would take upon himself all of that Sin and nasty thinking and judgment and criticism and gossip and, and evil and disease and sickness so that you and I could be raised up with him again to rule and reign. And we can say like the book of Ephesians tells us that we are seated with him in power yes. now Amen. at the right hand of the Father. Now we are seated with him in heavenly places. 
The choice of the garden resulted in spiritual death, but because of who Jesus is and what he accomplished, all the tradition and rules and regulations that we were weak in our flesh to follow anyway have been done away with and accomplished in the law of love that says to love the Lord your God with all your heart to, and to love your neighbor like yourself. It says we can choose life by being in him and walking after the Spirit. Jesus did this. It says again for us in verse 9, now we're moving on, or excuse me, verse 8. Excuse me, verse 7, that's where we left off. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. Okay, the mind, the carnal mind is death. We read that. Now it's saying the carnal mind is hostile towards God. That's New American Standard. If you're reading King James or New King James, it says it's enmity against God. It says it's God's enemy, it's hostile towards God. Yeah, what is? The mind is against God. Against God. Yeah. The carnal nature <laughs> is death, and it's against God. And what is death for a Christian? Tell me, what is death? In, as a Christian, do you know what death means? Okay, I'm going to ask you a trick question. As a Christian, now remember, with Christian frame of mind, is death when you die and we all go to your memorial service or your funeral, is that death for the Christian? No. 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 Well, then what does death mean to you guys? Separation. That's not death. Separation. Separation from God. Separation from God. Separation from life. That's right, from life and from God, who is the author of life, Chris. That's right. It's separation. So here's what I want you to see now. The carnal mind is separation from God. It's absent, the light. You're going in the futility of your mind like the Gentiles. And it's death. And it's an enemy or against God. Mm -hmm. The carnal mind. Mom. But whatever what the, even, it, also if the Bible says a lukewarm, and you spit it out, it's a mouth. Yes, mm -hmm. lukewarm. Yeah. So we realize now that um, the mindset on the flesh is death. But it also says the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God. Yeah. It's separated from God. It's angry and against God. That's your carnal mind. Yeah. Oh, Paula, it's just natural thinking. No, it's not just natural thinking. Without the Holy Spirit, it's an enemy of God. And right. it separates you from God. Yeah. It says, for it does not subject itself. This is in verse 7. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, the carnal mind, does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Uh-oh. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, you might be saying, well, we're all in the flesh. We're here. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the context of your thinking. Mm -hmm. If you just rely, what does the Bible say? Even in the Old Testament, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. But acknowledge him in all your ways. And he will direct your paths. God wants us to know that separate and apart from him, when we're not taking direction from him and we're on our own, we're in darkness. We're separated. We're on our own. And it's against God. And you know what? Let me use a natural example. I'll use myself so none of you feel bad. Depression. For all the people out there that think or thought or whatever they did, he used to say, that, oh, she's just perky because everything goes her way. Baloney. Everything does not go my way. <laughs> a lot of stuff that I don't even talk about because it's not leading to godliness or anything. But there's all stuff in my life. You just don't necessarily hear about all of it. I do share a good chunk of it. But what I'm saying is, there are times when I get depressed. Can I be honest and say that? I've gone to the doctor. I've gone to the therapist. And they have diagnosed, you are not clinically depressed where you need to be on medication. And trust me, I asked for it. They said, no. The doctor, natural doctor, Christian counselor, both the natural spiritual, both said, Paula, you have a lot on your plate. That's Any of you feel like you have a lot on your plate? Mm -hmm. sure. You have a certain age category. You have a demanding job. You have a demanding drive. You have your mom with you. You have a husband that's high power. 
personality type. You have a boss that's high power and personality type. You have things going on in your body that other people don't know about. You have a lot going on, and that's not an excuse, people, because you all, I can say the same thing about all of you. You have things that I don't know about that stress you. You have things in your bodies that you are believing God to heal you from, or you're in the process of being healed. Me too. Thank you, Jesus. But what was the difference? Clinical doctor, she could have just written a prescription. She said, I don't believe that's the answer. Therapist said, Paula, I'm the doctor. I'm the expert. You're not. Let me tell you what you need. It's a change in your thing. That's right. The doctor, you need some more coping skills. That's the natural doctor. Spiritual, you need to do things. Carnal thinking is death. Why do you get depressed? Anybody raise their hand? Why, what, what makes you depressed in your life? Give me an example. Yeah, usually people get depressed because it's not their way. They didn't get their way. Right. Anybody else? What makes you depressed, Mike? If you feel alone. Alone, right? And discouragement and monotony in life. It's yes. The same, old routine. same old routine. Yes. Some people get depressed because there is so much going on. They don't know where to start. <laughs> yeah, overwhelmed. <laughs> overwhelmed, yeah. Yes, Nancy? I get depressed a lot too because I've been through the water. A lot of bad. <laughs> That's right. Dad. Lack of patience. Lack of patience, and then you get depressed because you've had the lack of patience. Everything. <laughs> yes, right, right? Yes. That's all honest answers. So now I'll tell you one of my big ones. It's a big one with me. When do I get depressed? It sort of goes with what Mike says, and it's a lie of the devil. You're alone. So how can you be alone? You're in a work environment, your life, you're around church people, they love you, you got a husband. No, you don't understand in marriage you can be alone sometimes. In church you can be alone sometimes. At work you can be alone sometimes. And sometimes, the whole difference, sometimes God says, yep, you are alone right now because I'm trying to do surgery on you. Not on Tom, not on the marriage, not on the church, not on the work, people, on you. I want you on the altar. I want you on the surgery table, right? God says, I want to be able to do some spiritual one-on-one -on -one with you. And the only way sometimes I can do that is to get you alone through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. All right? So I have felt alone at times in my circumstance. I know it's not a rational... Um, logical conclusion. But nevertheless, depression oftentimes can be rational, like Nancy said, going through some things, but it can also be emotional, like Papa said about not having patience and stuff, and then you feel guilty and you feel bad and then you get depressed. All right. The Bible says that that's an example of carnal thinking. Yes. Now, I don't want to make you feel bad about that. We're going to conclude for today, and we'll resume this in two weeks after that. Uh, Father's Day service and the youth service. Those of you that walked in a little bit later, there's only one service next week. It's for Father's Day at 1030, and there's only one service the week after that, which is the youth service, also at 1030. But I want you to not feel condemned. Instead, I want you to learn what I'm learning, and I'm only going to give you things. You guys, I'm a horribly practical person. I love my esoteric studies. I love it because I get charged. But the real reason I'm charged up is I love that God gives us a place where we can serve, like in Hawaii, in the Holy Spirit, where you're free, where you're not encumbered with all this garbage. Why do I love to teach? Well, I love to study, I love to read, I love to, to meditate on the scriptures, I love to see you light up when you resonate, and there's another reason, I'm going to tell you the secret, because God showed it to me last night. I love to teach because I get outside of myself. Amen. Right. See, in ministry, yeah. that's why it's important that you guys that's all right. serve too, right. is it gives you an opportunity yeah. to get outside of yourself. Yeah. Amen. When I am loving somebody else, I'm not all, I'm all <laughs> So like Dr. Dr. What was his name? Dr. Smith in Lost in Space. Did anybody yeah. remember Dr. Smith? <laughs> with Robinson, with Robinson, danger, danger. Oh, with Robinson. This was a middle-aged man going to the little kid because he was scared of the robot. But that's what our carnal man is. He flips out. He freaks out. God is saying, if you would serve me, 
and get outside of yourself, you're going to find that there's a reward there. There's that secret place of the yeah. most high. Mm -hmm. I love to teach because I'm outside yeah. of myself. I'm being real and sharing yeah. myself, but I'm not so self-conscious. Oh, my God. I'm not there. That whole Paula is set aside to teach because it's what I'm designed to do. You're designed for something, too, service in the Lord. And when you're doing what you are gifted at, you're surfing. You don't have to think about it. You're not looking Besides, at the waves. Besides, You're riding the wave. Because the Holy Spirit is doing it. So what I want to say is, in conclusion, is Vicky has the key, and she gave a very good natural example, so I don't have to, is you and I are going to continue this walk. But we want to be intentional in our Christianity. And what I mean by that is you and I are going to stub our toe, we are going to wake up on the wrong side of the bed. You are going to have somebody say something dorky or offensive or insensitive oh, to you. You are going to have somebody misjudge you, misinterpret you, try to assign motive that you didn't have. You are going to have somebody be critical, somebody gossip. You are going to have somebody ignore you, be insensitive, whatever it is. And here's the thing. You have the choice now to put on the helmet of salvation. That's right. Amen. See, when Christopher put on the helmet, the headgear, excuse me, not the helmet, headgear for virtual reality, that enables him to engage in a virtual reality game. When you put on the helmet of salvation, you not only have the protection of the Holy Spirit, but you have God's viewpoint now. So when you're walking along, and this person, bleep, I'm going to say, this is your fault, this you are. If somebody irritates you, if something hurts you, if something matter. offends you, if something I'm makes you impatient, no your flesh is going to go out, ick, yuck, don't like, mad, upset, mm -hmm. hurt, depressed. Okay, recognize it. See it. you got to own it because you are a human. It'd be phony to say, oh, I didn't feel that. You felt no, it. Right. Right. And now say, but I choose life. Amen. I make a choice. My kid, my spouse, my friend, my church mate irritated me or did something, and I'm starting to react, like Vicki was saying in the car, and I'm, wait a minute, and especially where other Christians are involved. <laughs> Even that person. But with worldly people, too, we really do need to. We need to stop and ask ourselves, the questions, am I walking after the spirit, which is life, soul life, and peace? Or am I walking after the flesh, which is death, and is absent and separate from God, and is an enemy of God? How do you know? What I'm doing, what I'm thinking, what I'm saying, is it life and peace? That's it. It's an easy test. What are you doing right now? I'm really pissed off because this hurt my feelings. Okay, you're a human. You have a right to feel what you feel. Are you going to continue that way? Well, yeah, because they hurt me. Okay, but that's a choice you just made. You're not a victim right there. You chose. But they did it to me. I understand they did it to you. But you need to understand the devil does it to everyone. Right. And the Christian is the man or woman who has no condemnation because we're in Christ who follow after the spirit and not according to the flesh. I can at any time in the midst of my anger, I love my mother, she forgives me. We are a different dynamic than we were when I was a young woman. When I was a teenager and a young woman, we didn't have this dynamic. My mother, I'll be in the midst of getting upset about something. And then I'll catch myself like the car wreck, like Vicky's saying, I'm going, okay, that really sucked. I sucked, I'm not saying. I sucked. And mom goes, you know what? That's good. She doesn't excuse me. <laughs> she says, that's good. Yeah, you did suck. She goes, yeah, you were cranky or whatever it was. And she goes, but you know the good thing, Polly, you caught yourself, got over it quickly. That's right. No, no see, yeah. we can say we caught ourselves, but really it's the Holy Spirit. If we Amen. Yes. Stop making the Holy Spirit a woo. You know what? He's just no, as no, simple no, as no, saying, no. Holy Spirit, help me <coughs> to have self-control. Yeah. Yeah. Help me. To have love. Help me when I feel depressed and wounded and all self like this to rise up in joy because you're with me. It's not because the circumstance changed, it's because you're with me. I will fear no evil because you're with me. Amen. I will walk yeah. through the valley because you're with me. Amen. I don't have 10 of my best friends. I have you. That's what David said. I don't have my 50 mighty men. It's me, Jesus. And we're going to get through it. 
And the thing is, you're not camping there. You're not living in the valley. You're walking through it. Amen. Amen. And that's this life, too, for a short time. Paul says it's just a short time for this moment, but for a moment, this light affliction. He tells us it's light, no matter how heavy it feels to you and I, that there's a weightier weight of glory for us. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Angela, can I have you close us in prayer? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for this message today, life through spirit. Yes. Though we may be jars of clay, yes. you said we have this treasure that yes. treasure of infinite life. In yes. Us. Thank you, Lord. Your life gives us the truth. It speaks truth into us. It convicts us when we're wrong, convicts us when we do bad. Thank you, Lord, for your everlasting life Thank in you, us. Lord. And you said you've given us that treasure. Thank and you. it is for life, eternal life. Thank you, Lord, that you correct us all the time. We give you glory and honor for this church, this body of Christ, for what you're doing in and through us. Amen. And we're making a difference. And Lord, we are just making a choice to be good, to be truthful, to be loving and kind. Thank you, Lord, for everybody here. Thank you, Lord, for the body of Christ. And Lord, give us a good week in Jesus' name.